Moving on. Our main story tonight concerns crime, Batman's adversary and also his kink. Come on. <laughs> you think someone dresses in a rubber suit just to avenge their parents? He's a furry with a gadget belt. Grow up. <laughs> Now, with the midterm elections fast approaching, tough on crime rhetoric has been a key feature of Republican attack ads, often highlighting one policy in particular bail reform. Do you feel safe? Mandela Barnes would eliminate cash bail, setting accused criminals free into the community before trial. Landsman wants to end cash bail putting dangerous criminals back on the street. Beasley supports ending cash bail, letting criminals out of jail. Using cashless bail and his own lawless policies, Bragg has put violent criminals back on our streets and has turned neighborhoods into danger zones. OK, of course everything seems scarier if you end it with a shot of a body bag. For instance, <laughs> Doc McStuffins, not a scary show, but if they did an episode set in the McStuffins morgue, your kid's gonna have nightmares for a while. Now, these attack ads come at a crucial juncture for the movement to reduce the use of cash bail, because since 2011, at least 19 states and dozens of local jurisdictions have adopted bail reform policies. But many places have recently begun rolling back those reforms, because amid the recent spike in certain categories of crime, critics are pointing out bail reform as the major cause of it. Liberal lawmakers ended the bail for most offenses. They created a revolving door of criminality. It's almost impossible to get arrested and then put in jail unless you kill somebody. It is baffling to me that yeah. we have politicians that aren't supporting policies that are going to make things better. In fact, they're doing the opposite. We've and got... still supporting bail reform and defunding the police. There's a correlation between the bail reform and what's happening in our city. It seems so clear that it is, and to destroy the country's finest police department is, is, is a crime, I think, on its own. Wow. I'm honestly surprised anything seems clear to a man with resting concussion face. <laughs> he honestly looks like he's studying a full-body mirror desperately trying to find his penis. <laughs> and it's now to the point where any crime mentioned on Fox News gets linked to bail reform, whether it is relevant or not. Even after Nancy Pelosi's husband was attacked with a hammer on Friday morning by someone who was not out on bail, they had a Republican congressman on to say this. When you let dangerous criminals out, out on the streets, you know, with bail and not put him in prison, you're, you're just asking for this, this sort of incident to happen. Now, he's wrong about a few things there. Again, the suspect was not out on bail. Also, no one gets bailed out of prison. That is where convicted people go. And finally, choosing a narrow tie knot when your head is that big makes it look <laughs> like a birthday balloon sailing over the Capitol Dome. That is three big mistakes from that very grumpy balloon. But given that, you are hearing that misleading attacks like that absolutely everywhere right now, there is a real chance of all the progress we've made being undone. So tonight, let's look at bail reform. And this is actually our second story on bail. We first covered it back in 2015, but maybe you didn't see that particular episode because you were too busy watching the 69th Annual Tony Awards <laughs> airing the same night, where, and this is true, Kristen Chenoweth and Alan Cumming opened the show by highlighting one particular celebrity in the audience. And the producer of Finding Neverland, Harvey Weinstein. Yeah! Box office receipts for the last three months. Smile. Yeah. My point is, it's been a minute since then. <laughs> so, if you missed our first story, here is a brief recap. If you are arrested, in order to be released awaiting trial, you're often required to leave a certain amount of money or bail with the court as collateral, with the idea that it'll help ensure that you return. And there are plenty of issues with this system, starting with the fact that bail hearings can be arbitrary at best. Because while you might assume that a judge would carefully weigh someone's charges and circumstances to decide whether there is any reason that they should not be released, the reality can look very different. Take this hearing in Dallas. We're, we're going to bleep the person's last name here, but I'm going to show you her hearing in its entirety. Penny. You're here on a state jail felony theft with previous convictions, bond is five thousand dollars. That's it. That was the whole thing. And I don't know exactly how long it should take to put a price on someone's freedom, but it probably shouldn't fit neatly into an Instagram story. 
And the thing is, that's not an outlier. Overall, it is common for bail hearings to last only a few minutes with no defence counsel present. And they can be conducted with incredible pettiness. Just watch this hearing from 2016 in Harris County, Texas, where a woman had been charged with a misdemeanor of possessing less than two ounces of marijuana. There's probable cause. Bond is $1,000. Are you requesting a court-appointed lawyer? I guess, sure. Give me a yes or a no. Yeah. Give me a yes or a no. Yeah. I asked a question that calls for a yes or a no. I don't expect anything but a yes or a no. Not a mm-hmm, maybe I, so, or a yeah, or I anything say, else, yeah. or something. I, I heard what you said. Your bond just went up to $2,000. Okay, first, fuck all the way off. Second, yeah means yes. It's not like she gave you a thumbs up and winked. You knew what she meant. You just wanted to be a dick. And if you cannot afford a bail that a sassy judge felt like dishing out to you, you might be forced to turn to a bail bondsman. The way their business model works is that they will post your bail for you in exchange for a fee that's normally around 10% of it. Money, by the way, you don't get back no matter what the outcome of your case. It is a lucrative business which rates in about $2 billion per year, almost none of which goes into their spending on ads like these. They say I broke the law, police are on my tail. Looks like I'm going to the county jail. Gotta go, gotta go, call gotta go bail bonds. Bad boys bail bonds is who I called, and the courtesy and services topped them all. They worked it all out with a call on the phone, and before I even knew it, I was free to roam. Lipstick bail bonds, this jail goodbye. You know, it's not the direction that I would have taken for the Barbie movie, but I trust Greta Gerwig's vision on this. Although, credit to all three songwriters there. You can find all those tracks on Now That's What I Call Songs Written by the Nephew of a Guy Who Owns a Bail Bond Agency, <laughs> Volume 25. But if you can't afford to pay a bail bondsman to get you out, you are stuck. And many, many people are in that situation, which has led to a truly staggering statistic. This graph shows local jail inmates in the United States. In the past 20 years, that population has shot way up. And there's something surprising about that rise. You can see it only if you look at inmates with convictions. Around 1999, that population leveled off, meaning most of the rise came from this group, non-convicted prisoners. Every day in the US, nearly half a million people sitting in local jails haven't been convicted of anything. It's true. In fact, right now, roughly two thirds of our jail population on any given day are people who haven't been convicted of a crime. And most of them are there because they simply couldn't afford to bail themselves out, which is terrible. We shouldn't hold people captive in shitty conditions simply because they can't buy their way out. That is what Spirit Airlines is for. <laughs> what all this means is that a simple arrest, even for a crime that you did not commit, can destroy your life because even a short amount of time in jail can completely turn it upside down. And it's often not a short amount of time. Take Marvin Mayfield. He was arrested for a burglary that he insists he didn't commit, and he got stuck in Rikers for nearly a year. Before you went in, you, you had started a job, mm -hmm. you had, had secured a, in a, a place, mm -hmm. had a car. Right. What happened to all of that? All of those things, my job, my car, and my place, were all gone after 11 months. I couldn't hold on to it. It's true. He was in there for 11 months. And obviously, no job is cool with you just not showing up for 11 months, unless, of course, you're this lazy bitch. <laughs> and, and all of this is before you get to the fact that holding someone pre-trial can give a prosecutor a huge amount of leverage in obtaining a guilty plea. Again, Marvin Mayfield maintains he was innocent, but he pled guilty anyway. And when you hear him explain why, it makes sense. After 11 months, they said that if you plead guilty today, you get time to serve and go home. So your option was to stay in and, and fight this case, mm -hmm. or you can go home or today. Or I can go home today, but another guilty plea. Another guilty plea to a felony on my record. The worst and hardest blow of everything was to plead guilty to something I didn't do just to stop that suffering. And I get that. If I'd been held in Rikers for 11 months with no trial and no end in sight, I'd confess to anything if it meant going home. Lindbergh baby, snatched it. <laughs> JFK, capped him. Zodiac killer, it me. Just please <laughs> let me go home. And yes, I can see it too. There is a resemblance, except I'm kidding, I look nothing like the Zodiac killer, and you will agree with that if you know what's good for you. <laughs> so, 
Cash bail is arbitrary, destructive and basically criminalises poverty, and that is without getting into the massive racial disparities involved here. And when you take all of this together, you can understand why so many jurisdictions passed some form of bail reform over the last few years. And notably, in some places, it was done with bipartisan support. In 2014, New Jersey passed a bill that has since cut the number of people in its jails by half. And it was championed by a surprising figure. No longer must you stay in jail for minor offenses longer than you would have if you'd actually be convicted of the crime which you're accused of committing just because your family doesn't have $500 to post bail. Yeah, to his real credit, Chris Christie supported bail reform. And remember, this is the same Chris Christie who thought it was a good idea to be pro-traffic jam, got <laughs> photographed enjoying a beach that had been closed to the public by a government shutdown, and was the first major Republican candidate to endorse this historic whoopsie. <laughs> the right side of history has to be pretty fucking obvious if even Chris Christie can find it. <laughs> and yet, in many places, the backlash to these reforms has been swift and ugly, and it always takes the same form you saw earlier. Fear-mongering about how reforming cash bail means that violent criminals are going to be wantonly set loose on the streets to re-offend. But every part of that is much more complicated than it sounds. For starters, a huge amount of people in jail are stuck there on simple misdemeanours or non-violent charges. And even when it comes to violent felony charges, those happen on a very broad spectrum, from murder to simply being involved in a fight. And importantly, being charged with something does not necessarily mean that you are guilty of it. That is for a trial to decide. Yet too many people are only too happy to blur the line between charge and conviction. Earlier this year, Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot did exactly that when criticising pre-trial release programmes in Cook County, which implemented its bail reforms back in 2017. The mayor saying judges should not allow people charged with violent crimes to walk free on bail or electronic monitoring because if they're charged, they're guilty. When those case charges are brought, these people are guilty. And of course they're entitled to a presumption of innocence. Of course they're entitled to their day in court. But residents in our community are also entitled to safety. Wait, hold on. You can't say someone's guilty and then say they're entitled to a presumption of innocence. Those two ideas just cannot coexist. You can't be guilty and innocent at the same time, just like you can't be hungry and full, or tall and short, or British and happy. It's one, <laughs> or it's the other. Believe me. <laughs> and Illinois' bail conversation has only gotten more heated now that a statewide law eliminating the use of cash bail is set to take effect in January. Republicans have called it the purge law and have attacked it in some pretty gross ways, including these unusual mailers to voters. The papers, they've been delivered under different names. This one, the Chicago City Wire. They all claim to have real data and real news, but it's also a campaign message, not a real newspaper. There are two pages of photos of men, mostly black and Latino, who, according to the paper, will be released on bond in DuPage County. The controversial newspaper-like mailings are from Republican strategist Dan Proft, who runs the People Who Play by the Rules PAC. Wow. First, that is strikingly racist. And second, those mailers were complete horseshit. They say to the new law, mandates murder suspects awaiting trial be released from jail, which it does not. They also featured a list of charges that they claimed were non-detainable. But the truth is that in Illinois, as in most places that have passed bail reform, for serious and violent crimes, suspects can still be jailed pre-trial if they are considered a public safety risk or likely to flee. So those claims were well, basically the most misleading thing to appear in newsprint since the idea that Dagwood could pull Blondie. Come on! <laughs> look at him and then look at her. There's just no way. She's a stone-cold ten and Dagwood's not even a catch by funny pages standards. <laughs> she married down a long way down. And to see just how successfully bail reform opponents can demagogue this issue, just look here in New York, the big cuckoo city that go honk-honk. <laughs> This state's bail reform law took effect on New Year's Day of 2020, and just eight days later, long before there was any data on its impacts, state legislators were out there trying to get it repealed. I think people are getting scared. I think people are feeling unsafe and more unsafe as each day goes by. We're going to hammer this. I want to be clear. We're going to hammer this every single day. We're going to make the point that this is what the public cares about. That was just eight days in. 
So unless a ton of people chose the New Year's resolution, be scared of bail reform, and actually stuck with it past January 3rd, to <laughs> equally unrealistic scenarios, I'm pretty sure that Suffolk County Kyle McLaughlin here is hammering it away at thin air. And the thing is, violent crime did rise in New York in 2020, just like it did everywhere else in America, both in places that passed bail reform and in places that didn't. And yet, the NYPD relentlessly labelled bail reform the cause. Its then-Commissioner Dermot Shea repeatedly took to the press to label it a major reason for increases in crime and gun violence. But when the New York Post checked those claims, using the NYPD's own data, they found that in the first six months of 2020, out of 528 shooting incidents, exactly one had been committed by someone released under bail reform. And that wasn't the only time that Shea was misleading. He also went on a local morning show here to suggest that the suspect in a purse snatching was out on bail. He has 11 open court cases right now. Think about that. How is this allowed to... How open. is this allowed to c continue to, 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 to foster like this? Well, w one side will say as long as he shows up at court, then everything is working well. And I would... I would say that everything is not working well. It's 11 open court cases is something that you don't want to deal with, someone that we wouldn't want to encounter on the streets. Now, that may well sound scary to you, but I've got some good news. They found that guy with 11 open cases. It was actually pretty easy to do, because it turns out he was already locked up in Rikers at the time the crime <laughs> took place. So Shay accused the wrong guy entirely, but I'm sure New York slept much safer knowing that that guy was safely behind the same bars he was already behind before. <laughs> Just two days after that interview, Shea had to appear before the state legislator. And interestingly, all the fear-mongering and bluster that he'd spread on newspapers and TV completely collapsed in a forum where he was actually expected to answer honestly. Were there people out yeah. uh, who, 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 you know, with no bail, for example, or bail being set and they made bail, I don't know, yeah. um, and then committed another shooting? and we're arrested again for basically the same yeah. crime. When you look at who we arrest for crimes, it's going to be small numbers. When you look at the, the entirety of how many shooting arrests we make and the percentage, it's not dramatic. I'm sorry, the percentage is not dramatic? You were constantly claiming bail reform was driving up shootings. There are hermits on mountaintops who know exactly two things. All of reality is but the brief dance of light across the water surface, and Dermot Shea says bail reform is responsible for the rising crime in New York. And you would think he'd be embarrassed by being forced to admit that the percentage is not dramatic, but just two months later, he was back on TV saying this. Is bail reform what is leading to more shootings... 100%. ..and more gun possessions happening on the 100%. Streets? 100%. There is no doubt. Well, which is it, Dermot? Are the numbers not dramatic? Or is bail reform 100% leading to more shootings? Because those things are mutually exclusive. The only place where not dramatic and 100% can exist at the same time is in Kristen Stewart's whole general vibe. <laughs> she's giving it her all, but she's also giving us absolutely nothing. It's totally amazing. And the problem is, all of this, the exaggerated claims and the sensational headlines, have made a real impression on people. Public approval of bail reform in this state has plummeted, and the state legislature has now rolled back portions of the law twice, and that is the thing. It's hard to overcome the emotional impact of the claim that bail reform harms public safety. And I'm not saying that you can't find isolated instances of individuals who've been rearrested for new crimes while out awaiting trial. You can do that, and any time someone is a victim of a crime, that is terrible. But if public safety is genuinely your priority, Cash bail has never fundamentally been about that. For all the ads currently claiming that people charged with violent crimes are now walking the streets, they always were as long as they had enough money to make bail. Under too many places' current systems, a person facing a marijuana misdemeanor who doesn't have $2,000 is going to get stuck inside a jail, but a serial sex offender who makes, I don't know, hypothetically, a million dollars a week in finding <laughs> Neverland receipts gets to stay at home. And when you pull back and look at the overall figures of whether bail reform has any statistically significant link to crime, the answer, so far, has been pretty conclusively no. One analysis looked at studies in seven different jurisdictions, and none of them found that bail reforms lead to a meaningful increase in crime. And researchers even shown that if you can avoid unnecessarily jailing people, you can actually reduce the likelihood of future arrests, which does make sense, doesn't it? Because if you don't upend people's lives by needlessly locking them up pre-trial, 
they're in a much better position to stay out of trouble. In Harris County, Texas, the place where you saw that dickish judge earlier, researchers found that after cash bail was drastically reduced in their misdemeanor courts, there was actually a 6% decrease in new prosecutions of people over the three years following their arrest. So it works out better for absolutely everybody. But I do get that those stats don't sound nearly as flashy over footage of a crime scene. You can't make a crime ad that looks like this. Do you feel safe? You should. Study after study shows bail reform has not been linked to an increase in crime, and re-arrest rates pre- and post-reform have either remained identical or slightly dropped. And this dead body? It's just 70 pounds of ham in the shape of a man. Yeah, it's honest, but it doesn't pack quite the same punch, does it? And for all the fears of letting someone who is a danger onto the streets, again, bail reform doesn't take away judges' ability to detain someone that they genuinely believe to be a threat. In 49 states, all except New York, judges are allowed to consider both risk of failure to appear and public safety in pretrial decisions. And even in New York, it was generally accepted judges did it anyway, as potential dangerousness has been the de facto use of bail here for decades. And reasonable people can disagree on how exactly to make those determinations. But one place that some experts point to as a model is New Jersey, whose system now looks like this. Judge Sybil Elias is weighing whether to free or detain a man who appears in the county jail by closed circuit. Notice there is no mention of money for bail because the new system eliminates that. Instead, it uses information such as convictions, not arrest, not socioeconomic factors, punched into a computer. The trial court administrator will give each defendant a score of one to six for risk of reoffending and risk of skipping court. Even if a defendant has a high score, prosecutors must ask for a detention hearing within three to five days and must present clear and convincing evidence to detain someone. Yeah, and that seems pretty good, right? Although I will say it is by no means perfect. For one, assigning people a crime score sounds like something Robocop does right before he punches you out of a window. And it's worth noting, computer algorithms are not immune to bias themselves. One such system in Broward County, Florida, was particularly likely to falsely flag black defendants as future criminals, wrongly labeling them at almost twice the rate as white defendants. It was basically a racist computer, which I realize <laughs> is probably Elon Musk's next billion dollar idea. <laughs> And New Jersey's approach isn't the only one that can work. Bail reform has looked different in Harris County and in New York, but in each of those places, it's resulted in fewer people behind bars and no negative impact on public safety. The point here is, if we wanted to, there are multiple ways to design a system that truly prioritizes public safety. But if you count the accused as part of the public, which you really should, we should be considering their safety too, because terrible things happen when you are locked up pre-trial. And it's not just that you can lose your job and your home, you can lose your life. An investigation of over 500 US jails found that between 2008 and 2019, they saw over 7,500 inmate deaths. And of those people, nearly 5,000 were never convicted of the charges on which they were being held. Here in New York, at Rikers, where most people are held pre-trial, 17 people have died this year so far. And I know this conversation gets heated, but it's important to remember why bail reform was so important to begin with. And in thinking about this story, I'd like to share something that has really stuck with me. Because when we did our bail segment seven years ago, right until the last minute, we were going to include a clip of Khalif Browder. Now, if you're not familiar with his story, at 16, he was wrongly arrested for stealing a backpack. Now, this was the clip that we were going to use of him. The guy comes out of nowhere and says, I robbed him. And the next thing you know, they're putting the cuffs me. I don't even know this dude. Ryder's family couldn't make the $10,000 bail on the robbery charges. Months turned into years. He tried to commit suicide several times. In June, he was suddenly freed with no explanation. No apology, no nothing. They just said, oh, case dismissed. Don't worry about nothing. Like, don't, what do you mean don't worry about nothing? I just took over three years of my life. I didn't get to go to prom, graduation, nothing. Those are the main years. I'm never going to get those years back. Never. Never. Now, we pulled that clip out of the show just before taping when we found out that he killed himself the night before. And his death isn't even included in any of the tallies of people who were killed by Rikers, despite the fact it sure feels like it should be. The collateral damage of locking so many people up pre-trial is enormous. To defend this system 
is to defend a people-wrecking machine. So, where do we go from here? Well, if we're not careful, we're gonna go backwards, which would be a huge mistake. And I would argue that any future system should be built on a few basic principles. First, for someone charged with a low-level offence, we should prioritise letting them remain free pre-trial instead of defaulting to keeping them in jail. Second, whenever any bail hearings do happen, they should be longer than 10 seconds. I cannot fucking believe that has to be said out loud. <laughs> also, people should have counsel with them at bail hearings. I honestly can't believe that has to be said either. And finally, if someone is detained, we should be expediting their trial so that they are not waiting years for a court date. And I I'm not saying the reform is easy or that it's simple. There are going to be disagreements, even among advocates, about best practices here. But right now, we can't even have those important conversations because all the air in the room is being taken up by bullshit fear-mongering ads, fake newspapers, and confidently delivered lies from men in uniform. And look, even after convictions, we're clearly locking far too many people up in this country. But to do it before they've even been convicted of anything is proof that civil liberties only apply tangibly to the privileged, and for everyone else, they are entirely theoretical. And anyone even trying to defend a system like this is basically morally bankrupt. Isn't that right, Dermot? 100%. 100%. There is no doubt. Yeah, for once, I cannot argue with you there.